Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Polygon Live from GDC 2014. We are very excited to have two very special guests from Capybara showing off the game Super Time Force. Super Time Force. Nathan and Ken, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us, man. Uh, this has been a long road. It we has. We saw this game, I, I want to say the first trailer for this game two GDCs ago, is that right? Easily, yeah. We've been working on it for two and a half years almost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two and a half years. Uh, crazy development cycle in kind of the most backwards way. Uh, Kenneth and two artists at the studio, uh, identical twin brother artists, uh, Mike and Vic Nguyen, wow. they went to the Toronto Game Jam made uh, Super Time Force kind of the prototype version in three days, brought it back to the studio, and we all played it, and then we were just kind of like, holy shit, this is amazingly fun after three days. But Ken was working on a big project, Mike and Vic were working on a big project, didn't really know what to do with it, so we're like, what if you guys just, you know, take Fridays? And it'll be a Friday game. Awesome. So that was, what, like seven months of Friday or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it was a long time, uh, up until, uh, GDC, I believe, yeah, 2011. Then we're like, hey, maybe we should actually spend some real time on this, you know, <laughs> rather than like, rather than it be a pet project. And then it became like Ken and Mike and Vic on it full time, and then eventually the team started ramping up. So it was just kind of like this crazy rise of production. And that's we showed it after about 30 days of work or so wow, at PAX yeah. for the first time. Um, and we've been trying to, especially at PAX, but also at GDC D3, just get players to play it frequently mm -hmm. and find out what works and what doesn't, what's fun, what's not. So we've had some pretty big revisions to the game, um, and now it's in QA. Now we're, we've got all the content in there, we're just going through knocking out all the bugs and hopefully you know, get it onto Xbox 360 and Xbox One uh, in May or June. That's awesome. Well, let's jump into the gameplay and then I'm going to just ask questions as uh, you guys are playing and I will be in awe of all the insane crap that's going on screen. <laughs> yeah, so Super Time Force is a run and gun style kind of action platformer. Uh, your two main goals are to blow up robots and to have complete control over time, to, to time travel. Um, and the way that that works is at any point in the game or whenever you die, you can enter this timeout mode uh, and, and basically control time. And we'll, we'll show you some of that live. Um, there's a whole backstory to the game. Uh, you're basically going back through time to six different time periods to right some of the wrongs in, in history, like the dinosaurs becoming extinct or the rise that of... That was a wrong? Yeah, that was definitely wrong. How rad would it be if there so were dinosaurs? So dinosaurs just... Okay, yeah. we're going we're gonna to fix that problem. Yeah, we'll fix that problem. Or like having to download plugins yeah, uh, the for worst. the internet. Like that's the worst. So you go in the future, solve the <laughs> plugin problem. Um, in this case, we're actually in Atlantis. Okay. Uh, and what very few people knew is that Atlantis wasn't this like mythical kind of historical city. It was actually a theme park. Sure. Um, and it broke off from the coast of Florida. And uh, now you're trying to basically make sure that, that Atlantis doesn't go away. Very Jimmy Buffett inspired. Yes, yeah. yes, totally. Totally chill. And so as you can see, Ken is dying a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> the game is purposefully really challenging. We really love uh, making hard games and we really believe the, in the like, culture of challenge in games. Um, and so anytime you die, you get to time out um, or you can also press the B button to enter time out mode. Um, and what that's going to do is let you kind of control time, scrub back, find the right moment to jump back in, and it's also going to let you change characters. There's going to be 16 total characters in the game. We're showing you a whole bunch of different ones here. Yeah, wow. Um, everything from Ludon Jim, who is our, our Jedi-inspired, <laughs> please don't sue us, Lucas. Uh, he has a light sword, oh, not a lightsaber. Um, and each character has their own regular attack and their own charge attack or special okay. attack. Um, and they all work in different ways. So you can play the game really strategically, or you can kind of just run and gun, mash some buttons, blow some stuff up. Um, and the goal of being able to control time is that you can choose the right characters for the right moment. Sure. And as you die, you're playing alongside the past versions of yourself. Mm -hmm. So like the characters that you play through in past lives are like co-op players for you. Yeah. So we call it single player co-op. Um, and the end result is that throughout a level, you might have 10, 15, 20 versions of yourself. And, and it creates kind of an army of yous. Um, and so for us, making the game about uh, death as a gameplay mechanic, not as some just like discrete punishment or failure, uh, death is actually how you succeed in the game. Um, and then there's also like really crazy time paradoxes, which, ta which uh, Ken talked about in his talk. Uh, and what happens is if you kill an enemy before they shot the bullet, that killed a past life. That mm -hmm. means that bullet never existed. Sure. That means that character never died. And what, that's how the actual power-up system in the game works. And you can stack characters, so you can have two characters at once. You get two hit points, so you can actually take one hit. 
and you actually get their special attack as well. So you can end up with like Shieldy Blockerson's Shield Bubble and Jeff Leppard's Rocket all at the same time. It seems like it'd be so easy to break this game. Is uh, that why it's taken so long? Part, I think part of it has to do with the, the insanity of, of time in general. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, we end up in a lot of crazy paradoxes and it kind of breaks the entire game in a ton of ways. Sure. It, it's, when you play the game, it comes across as, as very simple almost and very like, yeah, obviously that's the way it works, but getting it to work that way is not the easiest thing ever. Right. Um, and right now, Ken is playing as Merlin, who you save during the medieval time period. Um, you get a whole bunch of different characters a whole bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. You can save them in the game, like actually find them and rescue them. Sort of like Metal Slug style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or you can actually end up uh, unlocking them through some of the completionist components of the game. So you get badges at the end for getting all the complete or getting all the collectibles and so on. The more badges you get, the more characters you can mm -hmm. unlock. So basically, you're kind of forming this like crack team of of time traveling badasses that are, you know. Very different in many ways, but all are really good at, sure. at certain parts of the game. Um, and when you get into it, you get to choose where you go first. Like you don't, it's kind of Mega Man style. Okay, you can like, pick the level. Yep, you can yeah. pick the level. You can decide to unlock Zachasaurus, the skateboard riding, sunglass wearing dinosaur, because you think Zachasaurus will be really good against, uh, you know, the medieval time period or sure. the, the future time period. So uh, the way the game is designed, obviously death being a big part of it. Do you think there's going to be like an obsessive, crazy internet person that is capable of beating it without dying? That is our hope. Uh, there's actually <laughs> something secret which we will not talk about too much because we really hope players will find it. But we're actually trying to like incentivize players to to speed run even. Yeah. Um, because we love that style of, of of OCD gaming. Like the amazing game, amazing games done quick is one of our favorite things. The studio basically shuts down. And <laughs> like, um, we don't do anything. That's maybe why the game is a little sure. longer in development. Um, but yeah, we really love the the we love completionist style stuff. Like collect everything 100% of the game. We love speed runs and speed running. And there's a there's a tester at Microsoft who's the crazy speedrun king, uh, other than maybe Mike Nguyen, who's, who's also extremely good at it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff kind of hidden in the game for different styles of play, and really trying to make sure it's super fun for however you want to approach it. Mm -hmm. If you just want to play it and mash some buttons, cool, lots of stuff's going to explode, you're going to time travel a bit, but you can also play it hyper strategically. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I know you guys were, for a little bit, experimenting with co-op and multiplayer. Yeah, like, we, we tried it a, a touch, but yeah. it's, it's the worst idea. <laughs> we're, we're definitely not going to try. It's, it's a, a predominantly single-player game. And the upside of that is that we actually get to focus our development. We're not trying to shoehorn anything in there. Or we're not breaking the mm -hmm. great single-player system to fix in some, some multiplayer stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a single-player game. Yeah. What exactly has, I don't know, like jumping from the original concept to this, what would you say was the biggest shift? I know the core gameplay has changed quite a bit. Like, yeah, it's, is there anything in particular that like you're surprised that like, oh, this idea came to this idea? The biggest change was probably the most obvious one, and it wasn't obvious in the beginning. It was that, and in the beginning of the game, like the very early versions, you'd play, you would die, the game would automatically rewind you back to the start, you'd pick a new character and play again. Um, and it was super fun, but after about 10 minutes and you got good at the game, you were dying a little bit less, and you might get two steps away from the end of the level, mm -hmm. die, and then have to go all the way back to the start, even though you only made one tiny mistake. Um, and also you had no control over anything. So you, time was just this thing that happened and you yeah. had no real like, power to move it. Um, so the switch from that to letting you time out whenever you want and then giving you the VHS style controls to be able to scrub through and find the right spot to bring in a new character or bring in the right character, uh, that was the biggest change. Um, but it was also just kind of learning how this insanely complex system can be simplified to the point that players will actually be able to totally get it really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that took us a long time. And I think the final biggest change is probably the sheer amount of stupid jokes and references to bad 80s and 90s films. Uh, sure. That, we ratcheted that up pretty hard. <laughs> I think more is probably better in that Yeah, scenario. it is. We've got like, I've got a uh, machine gun wielding uh, dolphin named Yeah, dolphin. I saw the dol dolphin Lundgren, of course. Yep, so, Who so else? you know, badass dolphins. We've got uh, a playable piece of crap named Squirty Harry who has a magnum. Um, like an the, actual piece of crap? Yeah, he's, uh, he's okay. an, an actual piece. He's not just like a bad guy. Sure. He's, he's actually a, a piece of feces that you can play as. Thus, oh, we're definitely not going to get raided very nicely by the ESRB. Um, and so, yeah, he, <laughs> he can shoot some farts and explode some farts. Of course. Um, and this game was, was a real opportunity for us to actually kind of like take the stupid sense of humor that is very prevalent at Cappy and shove it into a game and hope people will find it maybe 10% as funny as we do. Uh, that, which brings me to another question. Uh, with Capybara as a company, what would you say is 
sort of your signature? What do you guys, at this point, you've put out quite a few games over the years. Yep. What would you say is uh, sets you apart, I would say? Um, I think that's a really, like, if you look at it right now, we're working on Super Time Force, uh, like high action, very video gamey, very funny. Mm -hmm. And then we're also working on Blow, which is very aesthetically driven, very uh, exploration focused, mm -hmm. very moody and tonal. Sure. They're almost like the antithesis of each other in a way. And I think that kind of like informs the, the core kind of guts of the studio, which is we're always going to do the thing that we're the most passionate about. Um, and I think that like, Every, all of our games hopefully feel creative or unique in some way, but a lot of people can say that. And hopefully our games are beautiful or sound awesome in some way, a lot of people can say that too. But I think it's that kind of consistency and, and like vision first that mm -hmm. is what Cappy's all about. And you know, we've never put out a sequel, we've never done the same game twice, and I, I don't think we can ever actually do that mm -hmm. anymore because it's just not in our blood. It's, yeah. um, not that I wouldn't ever want to do a sequel, but we just, it, it's just the, the inspiration and the drive to make rad shit sure. is what really is the, the marquee of us. And it's interesting because we're in this period of indie games where we're starting to see these massive successes and uh, some indie game de designers are leaning towards sequels just because they had this cool concept, they didn't have a lot of money when they first made the game, and now they're coming back to it and doing all the things they really wanted to do the first time around. For sure, and that makes, that makes total sense and I think it works super well for, for people. It's mm -hmm. just for us, uh, I'm always really kind of inspired by what everybody else is doing, but I'm sure. also inspired by Ken and Mike and Vic going to a Game Jam game and bringing back this ridiculous idea. Um, and so how we actually decide what games we're going to do is very much informed by what's the most interesting idea that's on the plate right now and what do we think that uh, fans of ours, people who have followed Cappy even mm -hmm. maybe when they didn't even know who we are, what would they actually you know, really enjoy seeing? And I think in a lot of cases it's the stuff that we want to see as mm -hmm. well. It's, uh, I really believe that Players can tell when developers love the shit they're making. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I think that's like in 2014. That is very kind of like tangible, and they can sniff it. They yeah. can smell it when they can smell really bad marketing and trying to sell a game that isn't exactly what they say it is. They know that that's happening, and for us, it's it's pretty clear that we can, you know, uh, be very true to our own games. That's amazing. I love the art in this level. Like. It's a uh, throwback wasteland style, like uh, post-apocalyptic. Uh, post-apocalyptic, absolutely. Yeah, the character that you save in this world is uh, Melanie Gibson. Uh, I don't know if I... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay, with you. Good. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, would, I think the, the, the art style uh, is super important to, well, Cappy as a whole, but sure. also to this game. It's uh, three artists, Mike and Vic, who started the original game, and then Kelly Smith, mm -hmm. basically like taking our love and, and kind of like propensity towards pixel art, uh, and driving it in a super stylized, big, chunky, colorful way, which is very different than, say, Sword and Sorcery, which Super Brothers artwork is very, artwork is very moody, yeah. very kind of like uh, interesting color palette in the like desaturated style. So it's, I mean, it, I think you know we're really into the idea that pixel art is a style. It's not just this throwback. I mean, sure, it definitely has like a, a nostalgia factor to mm -hmm. it, and we love that. Yeah. But it's also its own unique style. It's yeah. also its own kind of like its own aesthetic in its own way. Uh, you mentioned Blow. Yes. It w appeared at E3 last year and then very quickly vanished. And yes. we have seen nothing of it since, and it kills everyone. <laughs> I, it, very little trickles of information, and sure. so we're, we're going to have a lot more information on the game very soon. Okay. We're really excited to get it into people's hands. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the biggest game we've made, for sure. Uh, there's a lot of work going into making that uh, procedurally generated experience be fun and unique and interesting, but there's also equally or more time being spent on making it fit the aesthetic vision to get Jim Guthrie's music in there. And, and that's another kind of like, you know, thread through Cappy's work is that, you know, Jim on Sorcery and on Blow are, are really good friends, 6955, one of the like best chiptune artists in my opinion in the world, uh, and one of the longest lasting. I mean, he's been making tunes uh, in the chip style since way before almost anyone and yeah. he's a great friend of ours so being able to work with our friends and being able to work with the amazing artists on the music side and then have our audio director Sean working with them to like have the audio design of our games kind of fit the aesthetic visions I mean it's all these things are super important to us and Jim's music in Below is, is very different from Sorcery okay. but it's so exciting and he is awesome there's no he's, question about that he, mm. he's a he's a rock star but you're not going to give me very much on well Below. it's <laughs> yeah well it's it's We'd much rather show it yeah. than, than talk about it. It's I'd much game. rather play it. <laughs> and, and, and that will be happening pretty darn soon. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. It's a, it's a game, of, the way that we've been describing it and the way that I think kind of like explains it in a way is it's this living kind of terrarium mm -hmm. that you're looking into um, and trying to explore and, and discover the, like, all the, the lore and the story and the nuance 
but you're also trying to survive because again, like most of our games, it's really tough as nails. And because it's inspired by roguelikes um, and really tries to take some of the key elements, it has permanent death, mm -hmm. but we take it in a different way where every life that happens happens after the next. So you go into the depths, you unlock a door and pick up a, a, a special orb and then die. Your next life, that door will be open and the orb will be where you left it. Sure. Or maybe somebody picked it up and moved it somewhere mm -hmm. else. But um, really the game is all about exploration. Yeah. The game is about survival because combat is challenging, combat is strategic. Uh, combat is fair, but you're gonna die a lot. You're, you're, you're just a tiny little character who's one mistake away from death at every turn in the game. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be really exciting to see people play it. And it's, it's, uh, there's a lot going on there and I, I I hope people think it's as beautiful as we think it is. And it seems like you guys are leading the charge in terms of Xbox One indie development. You know, they haven't announced a ton of uh, indies on Xbox One that'll be exclusive, um, but it seems like you guys were out in front of that. Is that sort of uh, scary, jumping to a new console, or how does that feel? No, no, I mean, well, it was scary until we saw them selling millions and millions of units. Yeah, now helps. it's much <laughs> less scary. That, that was helps. very validating. Yeah. Uh, thank you, consumers, for <laughs> making us not look like idiots. Um, no, it's it's been great. I mean, really, I, uh, specifically with Chris Charla, I've known him for a very long time. We've been friends and always trying to kind of work together, and he was the one that really drew Super Time Force kind of out of his shell in a way. It was like, hey, we want this on Xbox 360, and we were kind of just toying around with it at that time. So seeing him get passionate about a game that was that early in production um, and then working with Microsoft Studios on to get below very early on and I mean we had access to Xbox ones pretty darn early and yeah. got a, a lot learned a lot about the platform um, and then the Xbox one version of Super Time Force is on ID at Xbox so Studios publishing 360 Cappy self publishing on Xbox one um, it's been pretty cool I mean it's 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 really great to see Microsoft embracing self-publishing. It's really great to see them embracing self-publishing with Charlotte at the head, somebody who really does, I think, understand independent development, and uh, you know he's got a good he's got a good fan base there for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think like the at the idea at Xbox event yesterday, I mean Phil Harrison came by. We showed him some time for us. Had a great chat about about self-publishing and seeing that seeing that kind of support plus 25 games there as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to play Roundabout, but that game is ridiculous. I'm stuck here. Oh the yeah. Pain. You got to record the videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Roundabout's amazing. I mean, there's just there's a lot of really really great stuff. And yeah. uh, Hyper Light Drifter got announced for it. So I think they're doing their best to really support it. And yeah, I mean everybody. Is, no one's going to shy away from the fact that they're trying to pick up, uh, you know, follow or basically build up behind Sony's kind of like huge, massive indie push. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's all about like the more opportunities that independent developers have to hit multiple consoles to, to hit the largest audience possible. That's that's a big opportunity for us between PS4, Xbox One, Steam, mobile, Mac, it's Linux. A lot I mean, of places. It's, <laughs> it's it's bloody terrifying, yeah. but it's also amazing to think like five years ago we had to fight our way right. through gatekeeper after gatekeeper and now We've it's got kind audiences of, everywhere yeah, yeah. that's great and All i think it's, it's because this is what players want it's not because we're sitting there banging down doors it's because the players are asking for it the people in game culture want this type of content they're going to play towerfall they're going to play titanfall like there's no people are going to play both and they're going to have a great time with both and yeah the consoles listening to fans is kind of the best path to success for all of us totally well, that's perfect, and uh, we, I'm very excited to play this. Uh, this is coming in the summer, you're saying? Yeah. It, not super precise yet on the release it's, date? It's really tough to tell a release dates when yeah. you're in QA and certification in sure. that process, but we're, we're really hoping for May or early June, um, as soon as possible, and both simultaneously on Xbox One and Xbox 360. Cool, and more on below soon. Yes, soon. You will not be waiting too long for okay. that. We're, we're kind of freaking out to show people. Well, thanks very much, guys, for coming by. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll have more from GDC 2014 throughout the entire week, checking out all sorts of awesome games. Stay tuned.